some moments. There we go. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm hoping to do this catechism lesson twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m., as an opportunity for us just to touch base on any number of matters of the faith. You know, I, I don't want to do Catholicism 101. There's a lot of programs out there uh, for Catholicism 101, and so what I kind of want to do is a little bit more of the elective sort of things. I want to do the things that, that I find interesting, that I hope you will find interesting, uh, the kind of things that folks can watch and go, you know, I, I never knew that about Catholicism. I never knew that about the church. Um, and so, so I'm hoping not necessarily to try to replace the multitude of excellent catechism, catechism programs out there online and on the videos, nor am I going to be just commenting and ranting on issues in the church. This is a kind of catechism of the things that you probably don't get in Sunday Mass and a catechism of the sort of things that you don't really pick up um, in, in Sunday school. And so it's kind of a, a middle ground. And so today I want to look at the monastic life what that means exactly, how the religious life and how the married life kind of combine, uh, how they, they complement one another, and I want to look at what, the, what, what is a cardinal and what is a monsignor and these things that we hear about but that it's sometimes we don't really have a framework to understand and the culture is not really helping us because what used to be kind of generally understood now is less generally understood. And so let's start off by looking at you know kind of the many kinds of consecrated religious life that exists in the church. Let's start off by saying that there are two essential vocations in the Catholic Church. There is the married life and there is the consecrated life. Now there's some, there's some wiggle room here, widows, you have single people, you have consecrated virgins who are part of the consecrated life, but in a slightly different way. But the two biggies are the married life and the consecrated life. And the two essential modes of, of consecrated life are either secular consecrated life or cloistered consecrated life. So let's knock out some vocabulary. A married person, is someone who is engaged it actively right now in the sacrament of marriage. So if you are someone who has been married and are presently divorced, you're someone who has been married and is presently a widow or a widower, you're someone who is engaged to be married, then you are not, formally speaking, part of the married life. That doesn't mean you're a bad person, not at all. In fact, there's a very important place for each of those types of individuals in the Catholic faith, and there has been for a long, long time. But that the, the married life are folks who are actively engaged in the sacrament of marriage and ideally in the raising of families, but that's, you know, that's a whole separate thing we could, uh, rat hole we could go down. So you have the married life, and then we have the consecrated life. The consecrated life are people who have made formal vows or promises before the church, before a representative of the church. This is not the same thing as saying that I'm consecrating myself to the Blessed Virgin Mary according to uh, the, the, the St. Louis de Montfort method. That is a consecration, but it's not a formal consecration. A formal consecration happens when a priest or a deacon or a priest or a bishop promises his obedience to the consecrating bishop or, or the person who happens to be running the show at that point. Uh, it happens when a, a nun makes her either temporary or her solemn vows. It happens when a, a, a monk or a brother makes his temporary or solemn vows. It happens when a single person makes a vow to be a consecrated religious or a consecrated hermit. So it's a formal thing. It has a ritual, a specific way it's done, and it's done in a church during Mass in front of you usually a bishop, but in certain cases a priest. And so this is what the consecrated life means. Now I said there are two types, secular and cloistered. The secular consecrated life is the person who goes out. Those are your Franciscans, those are your Dominicans. They're out there, they're teaching, they're preaching, they're caring for the poor, they're doing what needs to be done. They're living in the world, the world secula. They're living in the world. They're living in the busyness of the world. The religious religious or the cloistered religious are the folks who are behind closed doors. They're basically living the quarantine all the time. They are devoting themselves entirely to what we call the life of perfection, 
uh, which would also be called the life of prayer or the way of perfection, the way of prayer. There are a lot of different words that have been used in different moments in history, but these folks are the ones who are consecrating everything that they do to the Lord all the time. And so, so just to give us a gust sense, we have the married folks, we have the folks who, who are associated with the sacrament of marriage but are not living it at this moment, that's your widows, your widowers, your engaged folks. Then you have your religious, your consecrated folks, and they can either be secular out in the world or they can be cloistered behind closed doors, living in a monastery. Now, the monastic life flows from the early days of martyrdom. Back when the, the church was first begun, this is, you know, Jesus shows up on the scene, he does his business, he dies, he rises again, he establishes the church, and then the church begins to grow and to spread. What happens almost immediately is that the Roman emperors, Caligula, Nero, Diocletian, and others, begin to persecute the Christians. Uh, partially this is because the Christians refused to worship and to offer sacrifice to, uh, the, to the others, but at the end of the day, they were just a good group to crucify and a good group to, uh, to persecute for any number of political reasons, and so they were vigorously persecuted. Now, this is a bad thing. It's a horrible thing, yet at the same time, it causes the faith to grow dramatically because people see the witness. Martyrdom means witness. They see the witness, and they become Christian because they say, this is so much more real than the cult of Jupiter. This is so much more real than the cult of Minerva. And so they become Christian in large numbers. They're persecuted. Finally, Constantine shows up on the scene, and he stops the persecution of Christians. There are some limited persecutions after that, but after Constantine, you enter this phase of, of history where Christians are no longer actively persecuted in the same way. This would seem like a good thing, but there are a number of folks who have in their heart this desire to be totally united with the Lord and to give everything, including their life, to Him, and they can't be martyred. You can't walk out the front door and knock on the door of the prefect and say, hi, I'm a Christian. Can you please throw me to the lions in the Colosseum? That doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. And so you have folks who start to embrace a kind of white, non-bloody martyrdom. And these folks move out to deserts. They move out to the cave. Anthony of Egypt, you know, is, is one of the first that does this. And they go out of, uh, to the periphery of society, and they lock themselves away by themselves, and they engage in the life of prayer. They engage in the way of perfection, trying to be with the Lord and to give their life without necessarily being able to have themselves murdered by the state for love of God. Now, that can seem kind of wonky, but when you start thinking about saying, I want to give everything I have to the Lord and I don't want anything to distract me, there aren't a lot of options in the three and four hundred. So this is what folks do. And so monastic life, the idea of a monastery, becomes a white martyrdom. And so you have folks like St. Basil and St. B or Saint, uh, Benedict of Nurtia who say, I'm going to go out and kind of be a hermit, and then people start tracking them down much as people did with Jesus when he wanted to be alone. And they say, teach me how to do your thing. And so in the four and five hundreds, the monastic life begins to arrive for men and for women. And it basically involves a bunch of, of, of folks who hang out together, who pray together, and who are all about holiness, all about giving every moment of their life to the Lord. They pray for themselves, they pray for other people. Folks start to experience miracles when they visit these monasteries, and so you have these religious orders, as we call them, that grow up. The Benedictines get their start here, uh, and then you, you, over the course of the next four to five hundred years, you're going to start finding more religious orders for men and women. Some of the names are a little harder for us to get around because we don't know them as well, but we're going to start seeing the Franciscans and the Dominicans show up about five hundred years after that, uh, and they're going to be religious orders, but they're going to do it a different way. Whereas the Benedictines, which is the big order, had kind of stayed locked into their own little monasteries and sought the way of perfection. Francis and Dominic are going to create religious orders of friars. These are people who are going to go out into the world and try to live the way of perfection, try to live this white martyrdom, but in the world among people. And so instead of having these two fighting against each other, you end up having this wonderful complementarity where these two different perspectives of how to seek the perfection of the Lord are a function of what God calls us to do.
And so it's kind of this wonderful thing where by about 1100 or so AD, we have the whole story put together. We have the married life, and we have the, the way that the married folks are made to live, and we have the religious life, which is broken into those who are out in the world and those who are cloistered, and there's men and women versions of those. Now, this is where we start getting into the questions of things like when you see a woman who is dressed in a habit, do, is she a sister? Is she a nun? Is she a mother superior? I mean, what do we call this person? Well, it turns out that if you're talking to her, you're probably not inside the cloister, which is the closed off place in her mon monastery or convent. And so if you're talking to her, she's probably an out in the world or a secular, in which case you would call her sister. So if you see a Franciscan sister, if you see a Dominican sister, you would probably call them, you would address them as sister. Now, if she's the, the queen bee of the monastery, if she's in charge of the show, then she she is mother, mother superior, and so she's, she's the queen bee. Now, most of those places elect for a term someone who is mother. So you might know, you know, you might meet Mother Bernadine, and Mother Bernadine may be serious and wonderful, and then you may meet her again three years later, and she goes, oh, no, no, it's just Sister Bernadine again. And she's probably going to be happy about it, because most of the people I know in religious life are very happy not to be in leadership. For the men, it works sort of the same way. You address any man who is a consecrated religious as brother. Uh, you might address him as abbot. You might address him if he's a priest as father. But brother is a generic term for someone who's in the religious life. If he is in the world, then he is a brother. If he's in the monastery, he is a monk. And so when we talk about monks and nuns, we're talking about people who live uh, outside of the world, away from the world. When we talk about brothers and sisters, we're talking both about a title, a form of address, and about the name of their, their order, the name of the thing, the way that they live in the world. Now, when we talk about religious orders, the big ones are your Franciscans, your Benedictines, and your Dominicans. But there are a slew of others that we just don't see as much in the U.S. If you were, grew up in the northern United States, you might remis remember the School Sisters of Notre Dame, or the Madames of the Sacred Heart, or the Marianites of the Holy Cross. If you grew up kind of more down where I am, you might have encountered uh, some other kinds of religious orders like the Trappists, or like like the Kamal Dalis. Um, you might also have, have run into Teresians, or you might have run into discalced Carmelites, or you might have run into any number of different offshoots of Franciscan faith or Franciscan religious order. So you might have the Capuchins, or you might have the OFMs, or you might have the, uh, if you live up toward New York, you might run into uh, the CFRs from time to time. And so each of these different orders and the letters after their name have their own particular founder, and they have their own particular specific purpose or charism, as we call it, what they're meant to do. Some are teachers, some are nurses, some uh, administrate, some are out there evangelizing on the front line, some are caring for the sick and the poor, uh, some are, are uh, just living the religious life cloistered in, uh, and each of them has their own particular purpose. And so discovering and figuring out who you're talking to is not always trivial. A uh, hundred years ago, because of all of the different, the different ways that the cassocks and the habits and the colors and all that stuff worked, you could get a good idea of who you were talking to based upon uh, all the different colors of, of the cassock itself or the piping or the buttons or the, uh, all the different stuff and the way it was crossed over. And it was extremely complicated. There's a certain part of, of me that finds that wonderfully amusing. Um, but all those different religious orders have their own different purpose and their own different reason for doing what they do. Within the, 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 the religious life, we can also talk about people who are stable versus people who are mendicant. These are just other nice big vocabulary words. Stable religious includes folks who live in the same place or they're associated with the same order. And so while your Benedictines are meant to live in the same religious house, the same monastery, ideally for their whole life, you also have priests. Now, I as a priest live in this parish. I've been in this parish for about three and a half, four years. Uh, and I'm here for a term of six years. I could be here longer, 
or the bishop call me tomorrow morning and say, pack your stuff and you're going to a different parish uh, and you'll be there for Palm Sunday. I mean, there's any number of things that could happen, but I'm always within the same diocese, within the same region of, of the area. And so my diocese, the Diocese of Alexandria, is centered in central Louisiana in a town called Alexandria. And so I'm always within that diocese, within that region. There's about 20 or 30 civil parishes or counties as you'd call them somewhere else. And those are my diocese. And so I am stable, even if I might move around within that region, I'm stable to that region. Your Franciscans, however, you, the guy who lives in New Orleans, he might get called up and said, no, no, move over to here, move over to there. Now, most religious orders do have some type of regional structure, but it still doesn't mean that you can't be moved from point A to point B. A Jesuit might serve in Mozambique today and then three weeks later be in Belgium for a bit and then six months later be in Peru and then a year and a half after that be the pastor in Australia. So, so they are, they're not unstable, they are mendicant. They're out there and moving around. They're, they're going from different places and doing different things. And so we have kind of this, this way of understanding within the church these different things that are happening. The reason that this is worth knowing is and it's not just for priests and it's not just for, for religious people, is that the church has within it these two different kind of categories of living. You know, married life is very much associated with what we might think of as the ordinary worldly life. You, you raise kids, you get a job, you, you buy a house. If you want to move to Alaska, you move to Alaska. If you decide it's cold there and you want to come back down, you come back down. The, you know, and that's it. There's not really a sense of authority over you. There, there is a bishop who's in charge, uh, and that bishop does have some things to say about your religious and spiritual life, but at the same time, he's not there to tell you, uh, you know, where to live, how to dress, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Within the church, though, we also have an entirely different set of people who are under a very specific authority structure. And that authority is not something we see as negative. It might be difficult, it might be painful, but it's not negative. It's something that allows that other part of the church to be at the service of this other larger part of the church. And the reason that that matters so much comes down to something that we don't think about all that often, and that is our human nature. Families, by their human nature, married people, by their human nature, are oriented toward the Lord here among us. They're the Lord, His love, and His life in the midst of the world in which we live. Him loving in all of this. Th that life is very much associated with sports and it's very much associated with education and very much associated with, with planning and, and work and working in the civil sphere and, and working in the governmental sphere. And so we want to say, how do I take the teachings of the church and make them part of the, the local government and part of my local school and part of the, the, the softball team? That's all about how the Lord is imminent among us. And in fact, families are meant to be an image of the living God, as we see reflected in the book of Genesis, image of the living God in his triune nature. Male and female, he created them, or rather, he, he created them in his own image and likeness, male and female, he created them. And so a married couple, in the fact that they have children, that they give birth, a married couple, by the fact that they are a family, are an image of the Trinity. They're meant to be an image of the way that God loves within himself. The Father loves the Son, Son loves the Father. The love for one another is the Holy Spirit. And so this whole idea of the way that God loves himself is an image of the Trinity. Now we know that God revealed himself as a Trinity of three divine persons and one singular Godhead. We also know that God says that we are creating the image and likeness of him as individuals and as families. And we know that while God is among us, he is also fundamentally separate from us. And so the fact that these things are, are looking to be or seem to be opposite, seem to be contraposition to one another, is, is, part of, is a helpful way for us to think about the way that the Lord reveals himself and he reveals us in paradox. They're not really opposites. They're just two complementary components, 
two sides of the same coin, so to speak. And so while God is a most holy trinity, he is also a singular Godhead. While God is incarnate in, in the family environment, he's also incarnated as us individually. And while God is, or I should say, while, while, while we are made in the image and likeness of him, he's not, we're not God incarnate, but while we're made in his image and likeness as a family, we're also made in his image and likeness as individuals. And so the way that this kind of works is whereas the family is all about how God interacts and fits into the world in which we live, the priesthood and the consecrated religious life, whether we're talking about single people, men or women, the consecrated religious life is not about how God fits into the world, it's about how God is separate from the world. And how we have to constantly realize that whatever we do here, it's not the same as the heavenly world that God has for us. This world is passing away, the heavenly world is our destiny. And so we have that kind of neat balance between God present and working in his world, which we might call imminent, and then the idea that God is super abundant, or supernaturally above his world. While we also talk about how families represent God in the most holy trinity, single people, I, sh I shouldn't say single people, I should say the religious life, whether we're talking about priests, whether we're talking about uh, religious men and women, represent the, the, the like, having been made in the likeness and image of God as individuals. And so those two complement each other. We want to see how we are connected in a corporate way. And we also want to see image of how we have a sense of completeness and integrity on our own. I mean, I find myself as a priest very happy, very satisfied with my life. There are people in my congregation, married people, who could never even begin to imagine the idea of living a life without their kids. And I, you know, God, I mean, absolutely, unquestionably. But the fact that we both exist there next to each other reveals, I reveal something that they can't reveal and they reveal something I can't reveal. And the whole idea is this notion of complementarity. And so it's not accidental that the church has established this kind of two-sided complement of one another, where the married life complements in a number of aspects and the religious life complements in a number of other aspects. And so that's why we have the religious life to begin with. And all of the diversity within the religious life does a wonderful job of reminding us and of showing and revealing all the different ways in which the service of God is satisfying. You know, if you're a married person, even if you're a widow or a widower, if you are a person who has chosen the married life and has led that life of symbolizing and representing God in the imminent, then you can look and you can see the, the way that a Franciscan is very different than a Benedictine. You can see the way that women in religious life are very different than men. And if you believe if you believe priests run the church, you've never met a good nun. I'm going to tell you what, women, the women of the church have run the church from the beginning. There is nothing more formidable, is my word, that's the safest word I can think of, than a, a mother superior. Uh, and, and, and when you, when you like I, I remember, <laughs> I, I, was, I was running a, a Catholic, I, wasn't, I was assistant at a Catholic school, and I was going to a football game, this was a, 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 a school called Menard in Alexandria, I'm going to a football game, and there are some boys up ahead and a girl with them, and they're telling dirty jokes. These are lewd, lewd, dirty jokes. It's a football game. You know, they're teenagers. What are you going to do? So they see me, and they know me, and I know them because I'm their pastor. And, and they kind of, you know, look down a little bit, and they, they tell the joke a little bit less. And, you know, and they, they stop telling the joke when they see me. But, I mean, I'm maybe 10 feet past, and the jokes come back. I look over and see a young nun, and she's young. This is, you know, her, this, I, I forget how old she was, but she couldn't have been much older than 21 or 22. You know, and I was in my 30s at the time. And they saw her, and they shut up and separated. She wasn't even a teacher. She didn't, they, they didn't even know her. But, I mean, goodness gracious, these people saw a nun, and it changed their whole perspective on stuff. And so, you know, the, the whole idea of the religious life is meant to provide a compliment. It's meant to provide this connection and to show two sides of the same reality, two perspectives on the same reality. And so while we have in the church this wonderful diversity in the religious life, none of that is an accident. All of that is a true gift from the Lord of something that reveals to us or should reveal to us how it is that God's love can be understood. Just as every family is so different from other families, so too every religious family is different from one another. 
And so if you find yourself interested in this, I recommend you look up on the internet, you know, look up the Franciscans and you know, go to Wikipedia and you'll see that there are Carmelite, fr there, 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 are, there are Franciscans and there, there are uh, 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 Capuchins and there are CFRs and there are Friars Minor and there are all these different groups. And, and look at your Carmelites and look at your, uh, your, your Dominicans and look at your Benedictines. And, and you'll say there's just, there's so many different kinds of religious. And it's wonderful just to have something to kind of think about and realize that God can be glorified and the life of perfection can be led in so many different ways. The last thing I want to leave you with is a, is a challenge and a warning that when we as, as people who are not leading the life of perfection, as we say, if we're a married person, even if we're a secular priest, a priest living in a parish and working in the world, it's easy to say, oh goodness gracious, that's what my life should look like. I see somebody who has no job and who prays you know, nine hours a day and they are deeply committed to their work and I look and I go, gosh, I don't do that. I don't even pray an hour a day. Um, gosh, uh, whew. And it's easy for us to say, well, that's what the life of perfection looks like. In reality, are they closer to God than we are? Almost certainly. I mean, good God, they're praying all the time. But that doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily be leading their life better than we're leading ours. They have a lot that the Lord has given them, and to whom much is given, much will be expected. We have the busyness that we have, and so I cannot look at this monk and say, I need to be praying in the same standard he's praying. Rather, uh, sort of like I preached about in my, in my sermon this morning at Mass, we need to look to the Lord and say, Lord, how can I lead the life of perfection in the circumstances in which I am? Whether I am like me, I'm a priest, or whether I am a, a married person, or whether I'm a widow or a widower, whether I'm a divorced person, whether I find myself in a good position with the church, whether I'm at odds with the church, how can I lead the life that's going to make me nearest to you in the circumstances in which I live? Because y'all, just as, as priests are responsible for actually giving sermons and doing stuff like this, married people reveal in the living the way that God loves himself. The family is meant to be a living icon of the Holy Trinity. So I want to encourage you and at the same time warn you, don't get that kind of medical student uh, you know, kind of disease where you say, oh goodness gracious, everything over there, you know, I, I've got all these diseases. We don't want to get that within the church and get into our head the idea that the monks or the nuns have it right and all of the rest of us have it wrong. We are trying to seek perfection within the circumstances of life that the Lord has given us and called us to. And so that's the way that we need to think about the life of perfection. And so religious life within the church is fascinating. It's very, very interesting. And I do hope um, that you will, uh, will connect with, uh, with the, the comments on these particular posts. Uh, certainly feel free, feel free to connect with me on Twitter and we can talk more about some of these things um, if you have any questions. But I do hope this has provided a, a nice, simple uh, co COVID Catechism Episode 1, um, just to, to kind of get us started. And if you do have topics you're interested in, please, please connect with me on Twitter at FR Humphreys or on Facebook, uh, and I can certainly make our next COVID Catechism uh, more tailored toward what you're interested in. And so again, this will be Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. while the quarantine lasts, and so I hope that you will, uh, will uh, remain with us. Hope you enjoy it, and as always, please remain indoors. We'll talk to you later. God bless you.